is an HP News Network special report. YouTubers, anti-nuke activists, and Plumegate researchers, welcome to another special report, HP News Network special report. This is your host, Patrick Penry, and I remind you that Plumegate is the silver bullet that will shut down nuclear power and break the back of the conspiracy. So folks, if you haven't read my book yet, Something Wicked This Way Comes, the story of Plumegate, the world's largest provable cover-up, please check out my WordPress blog or my Hattrick Penry Unbound website, and you can read it there for free. And soon enough, I'll have it in PDF form where you can download it and read it as a book and go through the pages and mark your page and return to it. I do realize it doesn't have that potential right now, but nevertheless, the information is there. Please go there and, and read it if you will. Now what I want to do in this special report uh, is go over some miscellaneous stuff I have in a folder that we need to cover. It's not necessarily directly related to each other, but it's all important and we need to cover this. So let's look at the first screen capture from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Freedom of Information Act documents, free and available to the public. These are pertaining to Fukushima and the series of meltdowns in Japan. Here's one from a divine at berkeley.edu. And in this particular email, this is what they say. I'm troubled by the report I just heard on CNN, which indicated that CO, I believe that's cobalt, was in the ocean adjacent to the plant and in the water that burned the three workers. Apparently the workers were exposed to CO, cobalt containing water, while in the turbine room. The presence of CO at these two locations suggests that water from the core is releasing into the ocean and into the turbine room. And this is from the 25th of March and it's going to Peterson at nuc.berkeley.edu. I should probably add Berkeley in on this element of the cover-up because a lot of people in there had a really good idea exactly what was going on. They didn't say anything about it. Okay, at the bottom of this email it says, my concern then was that the chloride would cause stress corrosion. Okay, he's referring to, let me back up a little bit, uh, the salt water. At some point they begin injecting salt water, spent fuel pool number four, reactors, a lot of these Number one, two, three, they injected salt water. Maybe later they put fresh water in, tried to clean it out. There's a lot of discussion about uh, a residue of salt, uh, chemical reactions with salt. This had never been done before. And another uh, group of people was worried about corrosion, that what the salt will cause corrosion. So this is in regards to that salt water causing corrosion when you inject it into these reactors or into the spent fuel pool. It says the email that I sent to you one week ago was prompted by our parking lot discussion in which you mentioned the amount of salt water that was being used to cool the reactors. My concern then was that the chloride would cause stress corrosion cracking of the stainless steel cladding that coats the inside of the reactor pressure vessel and of stainless steel piping that is part of the cooling system. I indicated that an upper limit SCC velocity of about 0.8 centimeters per day in stainless steel exposed to hot aqueous chloride. Hot aqueous chloride would severely corrode and possibly crack low alloy steel and carbon steel, especially if oxygen from air is also present. So this is showing that when you add salt water solution and it's heated, you have the potential to have this corrosion of metals that are critical components to the reactor, the cooling system, or the racks in the spent fuel pool holding the rods, take your pick. So the adding of salt water is a desperate, you, know, you have to understand there's nothing else they could do but try to immediately pump some salt water in there. And it was either that or they contemplated the slurry mixture of sand and bits of lead, and that would have just been to try to hold down as much radiation as, as they could. Okay, let's look at the next screen capture. This is from Marty Virgilio on April 16th to Eric Leeds and these are some excellent questions I thought these were good for us to go over very quickly we won't answer them but we will ask them he says Eric my thanks to NRR for the SharePoint site with a Q&A database there's like a SharePoint site and all these Q&A's 
are going up there for people to draw from if they need them. Again, it's part of the cover-up. That's to select information that they want to allow us to have, the public information in the form of Q&As, press release, talking point, that sort of thing. I would not have survived the congressional hearing had it not been for my review of that information. I believe it should be required reading for anyone who is going to be participating in a public interaction on the events in Japan. So at this circuit, they're going around the NRC to talk about the waste, spent waste problem here in the United States. They're going to be prepared with Q&As for this public interaction. They'll have Q&As on spent fuel pools and waste buildup and all that kind of stuff at these meetings. That's what they do. That said, could you please have the staff review and consider expanding the Q&As in the following areas? Why license renewal reviews do not include a review of the plant's response to external events? Why we should not establish a 50-mile EPZ in the U.S. if this was NRC's recommendation for the accident in Japan? And that's an evacuation zone, emergency protection zone, or whatever you want to call it. Why NRC does not order licensees to move fuel stored in pools to dry casks? Why NRC should not require the more sophisticated parentheses 3D seismic studies being voluntarily conducted by licensees in California? How the designs of Mark I containment plants have improved over time? How EPA is monitoring, collecting, and posting information related to the impacts in the U.S. of the accident in Japan? what process we followed in making the 50 mile recommendation in Japan and what influenced our decision making. How the process for taking protective measures following an accident, parentheses evacuation, sheltering, potassium iodine, works in the U.S. including the roles and responsibilities of the federal government agencies, states, and locals. And guys, understand that the reason he's prompting these questions is because they want to be able to answer them and not answer them at the same time if you get what I'm my drift okay he next time he shows up before Congress if someone asks one of these questions he wants to already have a Q&A prepared so he already has a prepared statement which is evasive it doesn't give a lot of information it's nondescript it's supposed to sound like it answers the question but it doesn't really answer the question at the same time that's what these are all about and that's how they obfuscate the information getting to the American public of the truth about nuclear power and so if you look at these particular questions they're good questions and we'd like really honest hard-hitting answers but I'm afraid you're not going to get them when you look at the talking points and I've gone over this they have the you know public answer and then the non-public answer too in some cases and the two are different the two are different one will say there's you know I have nothing to worry about and the other say hey there may be a breach of containment and radiation could be released so, so what they're willing to give the American public is not a lot, it's not a lot, but what they know themselves on the inside and that you can glean out of these documents is quite a bit more. And if you watched my video uh, earlier, uh, special report on the non-seismically qualified spent fuel pools and the NUREG manual that says the spent fuel pools are seismically robust, you can really catch them in, you know, a lie because something doesn't add up there. It's easy to find if you go through these documents and then examine their public statements. The two don't always ring true. Okay, next screen cap. This is from Fred Lyon on April 19. Sent to a couple of people there from the NRC and he says, for your information, attaches a copy of the presentation on Three Mile Island and Fukushima that Lake Barrett will present to the National Academies of Sciences today. Again, this is April 19th. You've had some time elapse and people are beginning to give these presentations. The first part of the presentation is Three Mile Island. The Fukushima pictures start on slide 15. The video of the tsunami cresting the turbine building roof is not functional in the attachment, so I've sent it separately. Okay, and at the bottom uh, says Lake's presentation is based on publicly available information and will be available to the public. You know, so I don't know if that video of the tsunami cresting the turbine building, if you guys have seen that, I've never seen it. I've never heard about it until I read this email. I've got another one where they admit that TEPCO measured a watermark on, on Unit 2, on Building 2, at 46 feet at 46 feet height. So here's another evidence of a tsunami cresting the turbine building. I can't see the video, but we know they're talking about a video that shows that visibly, which is pretty incredible. And 
probably something they want to downplay and suppress. They don't want you to know the wave height was 46 foot on building two. I mean, you translate that to some of our plants on the coast, and this certainly cannot withstand a 46 foot tall a wave. I think I San Onofre went to 30 feet or something like that. I have to go back and look, but I don't think any of them are prepared for a tsunami or an earthquake of that magnitude. So now we have evidence of you know, they're not ready for a tsunami, they're not seismically qualified spent fuel pools, so on and so forth. So we're really in a bad situation right now in the United States. Okay, next email from Michael Weber, April 22nd. Query, potential complication of contaminated debris. I'm referring a question to you that I suggest you ask the protective measures team rep to pursue with EPA and DOE representatives. And I underline that because I want you to know EPA and DOE are very tightly knit and closely involved in this cover-up. This is not a priority and can be worked over the next week. Given the list of assessments that are currently in the queue, their near-term schedules and heavy reliance on radiation protection specialists, I expect that your protective measures team rep has higher priorities today. Okay, here's the important part. Yesterday, we received two new Congressional Research Service reports. One of them was titled Effects of Radiation from Fukushima Daiichi on the U.S. Marine Environment. The report notes that, based on computer modeling of ocean currents, debris from the tsunami caused by the Tohoku earthquake is projected to spread eastward from Japan in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. Consistent with these projections, the debris plume is expected to reach the United States' west coast in about three years including beaches in California and Alaska. Because this debris was off the eastern coast of Japan at the time that the largest atmospheric releases occurred from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station in mid-March 2011, it is possible that this floating debris is contaminated with iodine-131, cesium-134, and cesium-137 from atmospheric fallout and rainout. The iodine should be long gone by the time that the debris begins washing up on the U.S. coast, but there could still be elevated concentrations of radioactive cesium on the debris, with half-lives of 2 and 30 years, respectively. Is EPA assessing the potential for U.S. exposure to radiation from this vector? It may be prudent for DOE to conduct an AMS overflight of the debris field now before it becomes more dispersed, to assess the potential extent of contamination of this debris. Such information could be used as the starting point for assessing the likelihood and public health and environment significance of contaminated debris washing up on the U.S. coast. Based on the results of the assessment, the U.S. may need to plan precautions and protective measures. This is huge, really huge. Have you heard a lot about this? Not at least of the debris that's going to arrive three years later. I heard that they sunk some debris, the Navy did, or something to that effect. But at least as of April 22, they are seriously considering this massive debris field and its potential to be radioactive. And I put a note under the screen cap, what about plutonium? They never mentioned plutonium. Mox fuel, I just got a screen cap the other day where the Canadians are concerned that we need to adjust our source term. In other words, the uh, radiation source in our modeling because they say we're not accounting for the MOX fuel. They say, what about the MOX fuel in the number three reactor? You need to adjust your source term. So I found another instance where they discuss MOX fuel, which is plutonium laden mixed oxide fuel. I also have a screen capture. I'll try to include it in this one again as well, where the Japanese say they're having trouble accessing the Fukushima Daiichi facility because of MOX sludge, radioactive MOX sludge is causing access problems. Okay, so here's that debris field contaminated with plutonium, cesium, strontium, so on and so forth. Three years, that'd be 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, that major gyre and debris field is expected to wash up on beaches on the west coast. Okay, and I think this is the last screen cap we're going to look at in these group of miscellaneous that I wanted to cover. And this is from March 11 at 12.17 p.m., same day as the massive earthquake and tsunami that caused the meltdowns in Japan. Okay, let's have a look at the first uh, email from 11.15 a.m., March 11th, from Scott Burnell to a number of people. 
uh, subject groomer control and I'll explain what this means in a second because I had to ask about it myself I, I knew it was something important but didn't know what it was it says all Elliot just took a call from Platts asking about Japanese quote-unquote utility execs at headquarters responding to the quake the reporter said another Platts reporter had heard quote-unquote from the regions maybe the regions one two three or four that this was the case while Elliot told Platts we are allowing Japanese regulators in big letters block letters to use our communications facilities as a courtesy the bottom line is that this topic is off limits for now refer any further questions on this to HQ thanks Scott and here's another one that says Elaine Hiruo Hiro probably not saying that pronouncing that right new Japanese industry is in town for RIC this was some kind of uh, meeting that the uh, NPP licensees and stakeholders were uh, already here in regards to but I didn't tell her that they were at our building maybe they connected the dots okay now what does this mean and why is this topic off limits it sounds pretty serious why are they why are they rephrasing the person and saying they're regulators not utility execs well here's the deal this is the same day as the accident and this email right here proves that on that same day the NRC had at their facility quote unquote utility execs people from Japan who could translate who could speak English who could speak Japanese and they were at the NRC facility and they were able to respond along with NRC to the crisis as it was ongoing at that time so the NRC early on early on had translators had connections had people from Japan from the nuclear industry they were already here and they were already connected with each other at that time so there's no excuse they can say well we couldn't translate we didn't understand we couldn't communicate that well hey they had great communication from day one with the Japanese translators everything you need to understand what's going on in real time okay and well nope got one more let's check this one out real quick and this is from some kind of committee RST 06 Hawk to a number of people there including the infamous Kathy Gibson request for op center RTS support here's the uh, important part we'll read down at the bottom so the objective for the second question is to support multiple questions slash actions there have been many requests of the protective measures team for quote unquote realistic dose models and that's not that indicative of anything in and of itself because they'll they'll have a worst case a least worst case a realistic worst case is kind of the way I, mean, I don't say it's right the way to do that there's only one worst case but in this instance they're looking for realistic dose models not that indicative of anything there but check it out where it goes from there the reactor safety team assessment document also contains recommended actions for the Japanese to consider these recommendations are based on the severe accident management guidelines which all are intended to protect primary containment since primary containment is damaged on at least two units we need to assess whether there may be new considerations slash priorities that are not captured by these severe accident management guidelines and this is important because I've seen this before where someone says and I've got a letter from somebody where they say considering it was multiple containment breaches and your guidelines only deal with a single accident and one breach of containment of one reactor shouldn't we look into what are we going to do if there's multiples at the same time and this guy is essentially asking the same question it's a relevant question it's a logical question it's one that we need to have answered and they don't have a procedure for that they don't have a procedure when a 46 foot tall tsunami sweeps over your equipment following a 8.9 massive earthquake they really don't there's no known procedure to handle that you just gotta rig some pumps in there and hose it with salt water and hope for the best folks and that's where we that's where we're at okay this is your host Patrick Penry and this ends another HP News Network special report hope you learned something you guys have an excellent day over this has been an HP News Network special report